booktube we're continuing with 2.8k q a we're at the third installment here and we're up to tim griffin uh with a bunch of questions number one can you recommend any series like the gabriel allen series by daniel silva that mixed thriller with history slash politics uh i strongly recommend the arcady renko novels of martin cruz smith they, they, this is the famous example is gorky park but there have been a few others strongly recommend them they're wonderful uh, question number two was was interest in was interested in starting to, okay you're not you're not writing a telegraph for the military you can't include a subject in your sentence was interested in started star trek where would you recommend starting the original series for the first time in the star trek timeline uh I would start with the original series. I know that, that uh, Star Trek Enterprise takes place before the original series, and Star Trek Discovery, I think, does too. I would urge you not to watch Star Trek Discovery at all. Uh, especially don't watch it right out of the gate, because you'll have no... You'll, your first impressions of Star Trek will be completely wrong. Uh, but it, counterintuitively, I wouldn't suggest starting with Enterprise, even though Enterprise takes place 70 years before Star Trek. I would start with the original Star Trek, because it's not so much a question of getting things in perfect continuity order it's a question of getting the feel of it the feel of the whole franchise first and that feel was established by gene roddenberry and his great writers so i would start with the original series uh uh question number three you mentioned the south boston catholic irish a lot in relation to fighting yeah yeah uh who do you think are the better fighters south boston catholic irish or the original irish <laughs> and would you love to get stuck in a group of good scrap at times yourself if you thought you wouldn't get hurt much uh, my days of scraps are over, <laughs> but uh, I don't know <laughs> who would be who would be tougher. South Boston. South Boston has changed anyway. South Boston in 2020 has gentrified out of recognition. So the South Boston that I knew exists in small, dedicated enclaves in current day South Boston, but not in Toto at all. Uh, DJC Silva ha says, number one, how did you and Richardson get to know each other? You mean Mark Richardson of Richardson Reads? Um, I, we met through booktube and then he suggested, why don't you come up for a visit? And when I realized that what he meant was, why don't you and Frida come up for a visit? I said, yes, that's all I ever need. If Frida can come with me, then I will travel. If Frida can't come with me, then I won't. Um, so we tried it out and uh, he is, he was, he was a perfect host. He was assuring me the whole time I was wearing, you know, what if she pees on the floor of your house? Something like that. Cause she was a tiny little puppy when we went up for the first time. Uh, and he kept saying, Lots of worse things. This is a very old house. Lots of worse things have happened on these floorboards. Don't worry about it. We're not worried about it. It worked out just fine. Uh, and question number two, why did you decide never to travel again? Boy, this is coming up often. Uh, it's just not workable anymore. I'm not able to do it, and the world has changed. It, so the travel is a lot more restrictive, a lot more expensive, a lot less enjoyable, a lot more crowded. So I, I, it doesn't hold the appeal that it did. Uh, let's see here. Mersalyn Mossadegh. So it has a barrage of questions. <laughs> you people just didn't get it when I said brevity. Uh, number one, how does it feel to be writing for a new outlet, which is giving your work access to a new set of audience? It feels wonderful. He's referring to the Daily Star in Bangladesh, where I have started what I hope will be a long association writing reviews for the Daily Star, an English language newspaper in Bangladesh. It feels wonderful. It'll feel a lot more wonderful once that new audience starts to get in touch with me. Right now I'm sort of howling into the void, but once they start to realize that my name will will reoccur, I'm hoping that a dialogue sets up and that would be great. Uh, question number two, what do you think we as readers could do if we were trying to be more sensible and intelligently curious when getting a book to read? Getting a book to read, I don't know what that means. You, when starting a new book or are you talking about reviewing a book? Uh, I don't, I don't. I don't understand the question, so I don't want to risk answering it. Uh, number three, would you would you ask your 1980s self to change anything about his reading habits? Nice try, bub. But as you know, and if you don't know, it's because you've forgotten, because I tell you often enough, I am a smolderingly sexy 28-year-old. Okay? Which means I was born in uh, 1992, so I don't have a 1980 self. Nice try, though. <laughs> uh, question number four. What are your thoughts on personality cults that tend to grow around writers and other historical figures? Personally, I'm not a fan at all. Neither am I. Good Lord. No. The only personality cult that should exist anywhere in the world is this one right here. Uh, question number five. Any thoughts on the work of Mario Vargas Llosa? He's great. He's great. 
Uh, question number six, what are some habits that you would want to warn young readers about reading if they ask, if they were asking for your advice? Habit number one, mo first and foremost, don't calcify. Stay an open-minded, nimble need reader. Stay passionately enthusiastic about everything and develop likes and dislikes, but not schools of thought. Schools of thought are deadly. Don't calcify. Stay nice and flexible. Uh, stay enthusiastic so that you're a little kid happy about everything until it displeases you. Uh, let's see here. Kyle Eckelberger, Eckelberger says, I've been reading the works of Amos Tutuola, and I was curious what you make of his writing. He's largely great. Uh, I am also curious what you think of Jay McInerney's novels. I read Bright Lights, Big City not too long ago and was quite surprised by it, especially considering what I thought it was going to be going into it. I hope the surprise was positive. It's a, it's a fairly strong book. And I Jay's books tend to be fairly strong. I, uh, I offer a piece of standard advice to young writers, which is don't care what the world thinks. Write your own book. Write your own books. The, the task of, uh, of a great author is not uh, to find an audience. The task of a great author is to make audience. People who didn't know they wanted your books and now know they do. And he, unfortunately, has never taken that advice. Never. In his entire career. Even Bright Lights Big City. He has never taken that advice. Even now, when he has nothing to prove to anybody, he's still writing for an audience instead of for himself. And I think it's, it's weakness. I think it, it relegates him... Um, it relegates him outside the masterclass of American writing, unfortunately. Maybe he will learn otherwise. Maybe all it takes is one bad diagnosis at the doctor's office, and suddenly that idea of writing for anybody but yourself goes right out the window. Maybe that will happen. Uh, but I don't get the impression that it's happened so far uh, with him. Uh, let's see here. Isaiah Armstrong says, Would you consider Thomas Mann's Death in Venice autofiction? since it's a fictionalized account of a trip to Venice that man actually experienced. No. No, I wouldn't. Because autofiction, that contemptuous phrase for a lot of writing in 2020, uh, is nothing else. That's why I hate it. Because it's nothing else. It is literally just a mimeograph transcription of your Facebook page. And the germ of a death in Venice is, is autobiographical, but I don't think even man's worst critic would say that's all it is. No. If, and if all the proponents of autofiction who are working today did to their original material what man does to his, well, then I wouldn't object to it at all, would I? Uh, how are we doing for now? Oh, we're fine. Uh, Trip Reads ha says, what is the biggest writing mistake you see beginners make? Uh, okay, well, there are two. The, the first one is not to start. The first one is is to just put it off and put it off. So, but, I, but that's not a writing mistake. That's probably not what you meant. The the uh, biggest mistake that beginning writers make when they start to write is thinking that it's a big deal, that it that it's uh, intimidating themselves about doing it, thinking that it's a big deal. That is deadly and always misplaced. <laughs> it's always misplaced, no matter who you are. No matter where you are in your career, you are always writing a contemptible first draft. <laughs> so, so there shouldn't be any sense of event involved. And yet I know so many young writers who invoke a time and a place and a mood and a muse. And it's got ever all that's got to be just right or they won't even bother. They won't even try. It's one of the only reasons. That is one of the only reasons to counteract that. Why I approve of this massive substrata of writing in Japan that's done on your cell phone while you're waiting in line at the grocery store with your mask on. Because at least it gets rid of that, that feeling of being up on a pedestal. That feeling of the enterprise itself being up on a pedestal is deadly. Just deadly. It guarantees that you'll write five pages a year when you should be writing five pages a day. <laughs> you have to think of it as, as something. Beginning writers have to think of it different. The, the number one, so what was it? The biggest writing mistake you see beginners make is thinking that that is putting it on that pedestal because then it doesn't get done and you have almost no time you have almost no time i want i say this to young people that i know people that are in their their 20s or 30s i say to them or used to say to them when i would meet them i'd say to me you are visibly older this week than you were when you came over for wine and calzones last week that's how little time you have you don't have time for this 
don't have time for all of this this fussing around about oh this has got to be right and that's got to be right i'm not sure of the idea i don't have every last detail nailed down so i can't start 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 right away start right away start right away <laughs> you are walking your dog on a road not much traffic you're not thinking anything of it your dog had a rough night you're thinking mainly of her and a quarter mile away from you, around a corner, out of sight, even out of hearing. The driver of an empty school bus on his way to his route has a heart attack at the wheel. He slumps down onto the wheel and 180 pounds of, of, of sack flab lands on the accelerator. And you are directly in its path. If, you don't have any time at all. You don't have anything to take for granted. So do it. Do it right away. My The main thing that young writers, the main mistake they make is thinking that they are on the very first must-be-perfect steps of a long and careful career. No. Don't think that. Just get to work. Uh, uh, next question. What animal species extinction worries you the most that you see is imminent? Uh, what well, They all worry me because they're all totally needless and tragic. Of course, the extinction of any species other than one on earth the extinction of humans would be a cause for joy but the extinction of all other animal species is just a stupid tragedy and they're all imminent the junk species the so-called junk species uh jackdaws jackals dogs cats uh that sort of thing the the the, the junk species that live in the interstices of humankind that can live in human cities coyotes some new breeds of coyotes that have crossbred with dogs or wolves are a little bit hardier a little bit bigger those sorts of things, those sorts of animals, the raccoons that I've got in the back, they are not in danger of extinction, but everyone else is. All whales, all elephants, all rhinos. Oh God, if you have a little kid right now, if you are an adult and you have a kid who's say under the age of six, by the time they are your age, they will be living in a world with no rhinos, no giraffes, no elephants. The megafauna of Africa are being chopped to pieces for food, even as we speak. So uh, now that all wears me and it's all gonna happen. The oceans will be empty, the megafauna will be empty except for game parks, and the game parks are being hit by poachers like never before because of worldwide wealth inequality, because of, of poverty. So, I yes, on the one hand, I believe that if you are in, in Lesotho or in Masai Mara or wherever and you catch a poacher whose whole reason for being in the park is to shoot an entire herd of elephant and harvest their ivory, if you encounter such a person, uh, then on the one hand, I agree completely that you should strap them to a piece of wood and roast them to death over a fire. Don't put a bullet in their head, especially don't arrest them and try to stand them up for trial. Instead, I, and this is not hyperbole, I believe they should, that you should cook them to death over an open fire. That's how evil they are. That's the end they deserve. Just so that every elephant within 30 miles can hear them screaming for three days. On the one hand, I say that. And on the other hand, I completely understand why they would do it. Because they live on $300 a year and one elephant is $3,000. So that they're, if they're thinking of their families, their loved ones, then that's what they're going to do. And if you, if you have forces like that, not to say nothing of deforestation, if you have forces like that, then that is what's going to happen. They're, that's just the writing on the wall. The, anim, the, animals, the examples of these animals that, that survive will survive in controlled populations in parks. Uh, which is the next step over from them not surviving at all, since there's no genetic diversity. Uh, but anyway, anyway, uh, last question from Trip. You famously have a remarkable ability to communicate with canines. Uh, my question is, if that has ever extended to wolves? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. And what your encounters with wolves have been? I've had many encounters with wolves. Occasionally, in even when I had ordinary human friends along, <laughs> who were stunned speechless. By those encounters stunned speechless there might even be a couple of those humans who are watching there there are certainly a few of them who are alive who are able to see it who are able to see wolves called to a campfire and head nudged <laughs> if you have not head nudged with a wolf first of all i don't encourage it because they don't like it for most people but oh my oh my the the if you are a dog person the experience of meeting a dog who is as big as an African lion is incredible. <laughs> it's just incredible. You put your hand on their fur and it just vanishes inside. 
it just the fur goes on forever and underneath that fur is muscle like you've never felt before not even on a bull mastiff oh <laughs> but aside from dingoes that communication with dogs extends to all wild canines all of them head boobs with wolves with coyotes with foxes with african hunting dogs uh, but not with dingoes. A whole species of dog that I have never head booped with. Terrible. Uh, let's see here. Marcus has a, a three questions. Number one, are you a fan of Samuel R. Delaney? Yes. Yes, I am. Number two, have you, uh, since you've been almost everywhere except Australia. Uh, no, pub. I've been everywhere except Australia. I don't know what you're doing with that almost. Uh, how did you like Beacon, New York? Beacon, New York isn't. Isn't Beacon, New York, where Bannerman Island is? If I'm remembering correctly, Bannerman Island is, is right there, isn't it? It's a, this, this great ruined haunted island is just oh, worth the trip. Beacon, New York itself is a city. I've probably, I've probably spent, you know, driven through it or something like that. But isn't Bannerman Island near Beacon, New York? I seem to remember that. Uh, anyway, uh, and number three. I imagine we might spoil an upcoming penguin, but I was thinking about reading Lorna Dune for Victober. I don't know that I have a Penguin Classic of Lorna Dune. I wish I did. It's a terrific novel. You should try it. Definitely. It has the clunkiness that a lot of Victorian fiction does. It doesn't soar. It's not brilliant. Don't let anybody tell you that it is. <laughs> don't let anybody tell you that it is. But it's a hoot of a read once you get into it. Uh, Mayberry Book Club uh, says, I've recently been watching and enjoying Star Trek, the original series. Could you talk about characters you thought had especially good chemistry or banter? And could you mention an episode with an exchange you particularly enjoyed? Oh, God. How much time do you have? There are so many of them. There are so many of them. Uh, well, what's one off, off the top of my head? A, a great, very unlikely episode, of course, a very Gene Roddenberry episode called Bread and Circuses, where the Enterprise goes to a world that is ancient Rome brought to the present day. So they have TV and machine guns, but they have Roman centurion ranks and whatnot. Uh and it's it's cheesy and hokey whenever the United whenever the Enterprise encounters, you know, the Yangs and the Combs or a Nazi Earth or a, an, uh, an ancient Rome Earth that 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 kind of gimmickry. Roddenberry grew up on the pulps and he couldn't resist it, but it's it's a little bit much. But even so, in those episodes, there can still be great stuff, and there is. Bread and Circuses is full of great stuff, absolutely full of it. Uh, when when the uh, the evil Roman. Who is the who has corrupted a starship, uh, a star, uh, not a starship, but a star fleet captain, Captain Merrick of the USS Beagle, uh, who is not a starship captain. They're, and keep in mind, in the original idea of this of Roddenberry Star Trek, there are only twelve starships, big, huge, state of the state of the art ships of the line. There are only twelve of them. There are plenty of other ships, plenty of lesser ships. And Merrick was the captain of one of those. He actually tells his Roman corruptor that he he commands not just a spaceship but a starship. Kirk does. And that's a different kind of person. Uh, but at one point, that Roman that Roman official says to Spock, so you're a Vulcan. From what I've heard, I wish I had a dozen of you for the arena. Because <laughs> they are superior. Dorothy Fontana was strictly in charge of that episode. And Vulcans are superior, physically, to humans. And we see that when Spock and McCoy are in a, a televised gladiatorial combat. And Spock is paying attention to McCoy. He's just offhandedly fending off his Roman soldier. Uh, and at one point says to him, I assure you, I am well able to defeat you. And his Roman, his Roman opponent says, fight, you freak. And when it comes time to it, when Spock has to save McCoy, he defeats his opponent in two seconds. And that, that is awesome. But the thing that I remember about that episode most is an exchange that Spock and McCoy have when they are in prison. And they don't know what's happening to Jim Kirk. And they're both worried about him. And McCoy expresses his worry by attacking Spock. And Spock uh, uh, fends it off. It, it's a perfect little microcosm of their relationship. And it ends with, uh, with them admitting that they're both just worried about the captain. That's all. It's a great, great moment. Uh, uh, but anyway, your, your other question, uh, what are your thoughts on Emily Wilson and also her translation of the Odyssey? Well, I like her translation of the Odyssey. The more I learn about her as a person, the less I like, but uh, I'll have to separate those things. Uh, William Fett says, what are your thoughts on the five-volume series Finders and Makers by Van Wyke Brooks? Also, what do you think of Tennessee Williams? Tennessee Williams, I think, is overrated as a, as a dramatist. Uh, 
But uh, Van Wyck Brooks's books are terrific. They're a little bit odd, I think, because they, they increasingly, as that series goes along, they become less useful for the beginner. They become a, a kind of a detailed overview that's only good if you know about as much of that period as Van Wyck Brooks himself does. So for me, they're a feast. You know, for for some a reader like like uh, who who knows all of that material already, like for instance, especially his New England books, Mark Richardson could read them and say, "Ah, oh, yeah, I get, yeah." When he makes that off-handed reference to Endicott or Prescott, yeah, I know what he means. But other readers, I don't know because it, Van Wyke Brooks doesn't actually explain that offhand reference in the course of the book. So I'm not sure what they what a beginning reader would do with them. They are incredibly incredibly inviting just on the writing level, uh, but. Uh, I very much like them for that reason. I wish I had a whole uniform set. I think I have only two. Uh, let's see here. Rena Johnson uh, says, In past Q&As, you've discussed America's political parallels to 1930s Germany and leaving if we're able. If there were no COVID restrictions, what places do you think would be hospitable to globally ignorant American expats? Uh, I wouldn't name any particular places. Go wherever you want. Anywhere would be better. Uh, almost anywhere in the, in the world would be better. Go someplace with a liberal democratic government with uh, normal, sensible social safety nets with uh, an employment possibilities and a rational, humanistic population go someplace like that. Uh, but I wouldn't name a particular spot. Uh, Winifred Lee says, number one, would you say Ken Burns documentaries are good companions to history books? Sure, they're better. Uh, number two, it may be a bit old now, but is the World at War series narrated by Laurence Olivier deserving of a watch through? Or should I just shut up and read? Uh, he's definitely deserving of a watch there, yes. Uh, in, uh, in question number three, in Palimpsest, Vidal talks rather fondly of Christopher Isherwood. Is he, like Vidal, someone belonging to the better side of 20th century literature? Yes, very much so. You should read all of Christopher Isherwood. Uh, Richard Schwartz says, uh, you read several hours a day. How do you remain focused over so long stretches? Not everything you read is life-changing. True, not everything I read is life-changing. Plenty of ordinary and average books, or less than average. Uh, but it's not hard for me. It's just a habit. Staying focused for long periods of time is just a, a muscle. You can just exercise it. It's so that it doesn't know how involved. I stay focused for long stretches of time the same way I would stay focused for short stretches of time. It's just that muscle is in really good shape for me. Uh, David Adams says, thank you for introducing me to new literature. Your enthusiasm is infectious. I hope so. Uh, it feels wonderful to hear that, though. Uh, I'm thinking I need that bat book in my life, a subject that I thought nothing of until you spoke with such passion of it the other day. Okay, well, I, would, I would urge against that. If what you're talking about is Philostomid Bats, that big University of Chicago Press book that I got, it made me squeal because I know a lot about bats. I wouldn't advise it if you know nothing about the subject, as glorious a book as it is. I wouldn't. There are plenty of other bat books that you could do instead. The reason that I squealed was because it, of its appeal to me. Uh, because I, I have read a lot on bats, so I'm not coming at it cold. But I've read the book now. And it is, it is not a book for people who've never read anything scientific about bats. It, it doesn't have such readers in mind. Uh, let's see here. Bob Van Beek says, You've said how bad a novel The Green Mile is, <laughs> but how do you feel about the movie? Uh, also, thoughts on Mo Yan. Mo Yan is really good. And the movie Green Mile is really good as well. Very effective as a movie. Uh, John M. says, I was wondering what your thoughts were on the poetry of Francis Thompson. I love it. Absolutely love it. Uh, Luke and Jennifer Higgins have a barrage of questions. <laughs> uh, number one, how much will you pay us if we actually have documented proof that we've read Orlando Furiosa? <laughs> I won't pay you anything, but you'll enjoy it. And if you don't, let me know and I'll help you. Uh, question number two, what are your thoughts on the Nero Wolf mysteries? Also, I read that I love the Nero Wolf mysteries. Uh, also, I read that Rex Stout had read the entire Bible twice by the age of four. Is that even remotely possible? No, that is not possible, and it certainly didn't happen. Uh, question number three, do you enjoy the Cosgrove Report or Poor Richard's Game by G.J.A. O'Toole? I certainly did. I don't think I know those books. And question number four, Amelia asked, chomping on a Dorito, what Steve and Frida's favorite snacks are. Uh, Frida likes crusts of bread and dog treats of all kinds. And as far as my favorite snacks, well, Mega Stuff Oreos are right up there on the list, but they're a lot worse for you than Doritos. Doritos, especially, of course, Cool Ranch Doritos, are the nectar of the gods. Uh, M-N-I-K-M 
Uh, let's see here. It says a uh, barrage of questions. I <laughs> know you people just didn't get the brevity part. You just didn't do it. Uh, number one, supposing you hold, you hold Ayn Rand in literary contempt, and I do, uh, what is your advice on battling 20-year-old pseudo-intellectuals who passively-aggressively quote her in your face? Should I read her entire oeuvre just to tell them to shut up? No. No, that's wrong on two levels. Number one, you shouldn't ever read someone's entire body of work just because insufferable people want you to. That is, your, your reading time is extremely limited. It's extremely precious. So... You should never read someone for that bad a reason, no. But number two, another reason why this is wrong is that you shouldn't tell such pseudo-intellectuals to shut up. You lose them that way. You don't want to lose them. You want to convert them. You want to change them into real people. They're, most of them will still be salvageable. You can, most of them can be reached. Uh, so telling them to shut up under any circumstances is a bad, is a bad game plan. Uh, Question number two, what is your recommendation for a basic but still solid overview of politics and political systems in general? God help us. Wikipedia. Type in politics and political systems in Wikipedia and read up to your heart's content. Uh, don't bother with a book on the subject. Uh, and question number three, could you please grace us with a literary criticism starter kit? <coughs> for now, though, could you please throw us a few of your favorite titles? Actual academic literary criticism is almost entirely worthless. It is the, uh, the reading-based equivalent of philosophy. If you mean, by literary criticism, you mean people writing about books, like in this book case here, books on writing, reading, overviews, prefaces, reviews, that sort of thing. I could make an, a starter kit on that. Although you should, Virginia Woolf is never a bad place to start. Or the great Clive James. Uh, uh, Gunnar says, did you ever encounter big cats in the wild and did they recognize the natural enemy in you? I encountered big cats many, many times, yes. And it was always terrifying. Mostly... Uh, not so bad because they cats are very risk averse predators they really are they're very risk averse so if they don't if they don't completely understand the situation that they're in they'll just vanish usually they'll just vanish that it's very rare not to i encountered a mountain lion in nevada that was oddly persistent that just never happens and then uh, mountain lions are surprise killers they they perch on a, a wooded rocky outcrop over a path so that they can use their body weight to bring down their prey and then crack its neck or suffocate it while it's disoriented. They really aren't muscle predators at all. Uh, so if you encounter one on flat ground, you, you expected, I expected to just scamper away. They usually will, but this one was weirdly persistent. A, with a full grown man and six dogs, that is almost unheard of. That took a little bit of effort. And, but most of the time, no, because cats are very risk-averse predators. So most of the time, they won't try anything in the wild. They, they will, discretion will be the better part of valor for them unless they're completely sure of the situation. I remember, so for instance, I've, for that reason, I've never had much of a problem with lions in Africa. Because I was walking either alone or with other humans and always with a crowd of dogs. Lions won't do that. Generally speaking, they won't do that, especially if you're leaving them alone. Uh, one time I was camping in India, and I think I told this story before, it was early morning, uh, before dawn actually, but the light was up everywhere, and I had come to the door of my tent because the camp was nice and quiet, my beagles were all sound asleep in the tent behind me, and I just sort of scanned the wooden, we were in the middle of a forest, so there, was, there were just trees everywhere, and I just scanned the wall of trees just in an idle way you look around in the morning i scanned the wall of trees and then i scanned back and saw it a tiger's head just just looking at me looking directly at me from about 30 feet away you would you missed it the first time because they're so perfectly blended with the shadows and the darks and the, the stripes of a forest but i missed it the first time and then saw it this 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 head that was as big as one of my dogs just and we just stared at each other for a minute, and I thought, I thought all the predictable things. I thought, no one's up and about. I don't have a gun, obviously. Never fired a gun. My dogs are sound asleep, but I wouldn't risk them anyway. If this thing charges, it can cover that 30, ground, that 30 feet in one bound, and I'm defenseless. Uh, this, the fire was out as well. It was just, there was nothing at all. It was just an early morning encounter. Of course, it wanted nothing to do. It was just curious. It wanted to do nothing of the kind, and left. The next time I looked, that spot was empty. Uh, th things like that, I'm sure, happened a lot, and I didn't know about it. Uh, 
James Holder says, uh, how are we doing for time? Oh, well, let's do James Holder and then we'll be done. James Holder says, why are you interested in right-wing YouTube? How pervasive do you think their influence is? They're mighty pervasive and they have greater numbers than you think. I'm interested in them just because most of them are, they represent, most of them are men. 99% of them are men and 99% of them are men from the ages of 18 to 25 and they are my calling. Men that age are a specialty of mine. And I look, at, I look at these boys and I say, okay, if you had a Steve in your life, he badly failed you. Badly. Or you didn't have a Steve in your life. And either one, it, I look at them and aut I automatically can't help but be drawn to say, okay, but you could still be fixed. You could still be fixed. You just don't have a father figure. That's all. That's the only reason you're like this. It's because you, you don't have an older male that you can test your strength against. You don't have someone like that. And you you badly need it. And I, so that it has a personal fascination for me as well. Because th these are all my boys, only gone wrong. Uh, and question number two, have you settled on a NaNoWriMo project yet? No, I haven't, but it's going to happen this weekend. But anyway, we're going to wrap this up. Uh, we're at 30 minutes, so we're, we're gonna, I'm going to wrap this up and we'll come right back.